Thank you. Um, first of all, uh, I'd like to uh, thank the conference organisers for the opportunity to speak with you. As mentioned, I work for the European Ombudsman. Uh, the European Ombudsman is an institution uh, which has uh, the task of dealing with inquiries concerning maladministration by EU institutions such as the European Commission, the European Central Bank, and European agencies such as European Food Safety Agency, European Aviation Safety Agency, and uh, the European Medicines Agency. Um, <clears throat> approximately 35% of the cases we deal with concern transparency. Transparency is extremely important for a public service. It's not an end in itself. It ensures that the public service is accountable, can be held accountable, that it is independent, that it is, it is efficient in what it does and, in effect, and effective in what it seeks to achieve, and that it is participative. That's important across the entire public se ser service, but it's particularly important when the public service deals with issues which have a direct impact on the welfare of citizens. And that's certainly the case as regards the work of the European Medicines Agency. The European Medicines Agency has been the subject of numerous inquiries by the Ombudsman since 2007. And what I do in order to try and illustrate to you our work and the application of the rules and where we are now and where we are going forward on this issue, so I'll describe three cases to you. The first case um, goes back to um, 2007 and it dealt with the a request for access by, by Cochrane, uh, by Peter Gotche, I think he's here in, in, in the audience. Um, concerning access to documents relating to the assessment of um, Rimonavant, which is um, a medicine used for, it's an anti-obesity uh, drug. And um, when uh, Cochrane sought access to uh, these documents from the European Medicines Agency, the European Medicines Agency met a number of arguments in order to deny any access to those documents. It argued uh, that the documents con contained uh, patient data. Now, maybe just, I'll just stop on that particular point because this is an argument that's often made and it's not a controversial argument in law. There is no doubt that any patient data or any information that might be used to uh, uh, indirectly identify patients should be redacted from documents. So it's not an argument that is relevant as regards the assessment because it's a given that such information should be redacted. Um, having said that, and as, as, you, as you know, uh, clinical studies are normally designed at source to redact all such patient data. It's only when you're maybe talking about rare diseases or particular very uh, tests on very limited subgroups such as on uh, pediatric patients that um, there might be a, a, a real danger of indirectly identifying patients. More controversially, they argued that the release of the um, requested documents would impact upon the uh, commercial interests of the pharmaceutical company concerned, which was in that case um, Zanofi Aventus. Um, <clears throat> This is a very, very controversial argument, and as we will see in the other cases, I may be described to you specific information which has been redacted from uh, CSRs, um, so, so that you understand how controversial uh, this issue is. Because clearly, you might understand there is a commercial interest in a pharmaceutical company uh, not making known um, uh, information which might call into question or. Uh, the effectiveness of a medicine. I doubt that any uh, ethical pharmaceutical company uh, would, might wish to hide information relating to safety. But certainly, in terms of uh, 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 marketing uh, of a particular product, pharmaceutical companies do wish to con maintain strict control over the flow of information relate relating to the effectiveness of, um, of, of a medicine. Um, the, um, the end result of that case was that 
when asked, when pressed on the issue of uh, precisely what commercial interests um, uh, would be compromised by the release of those documents, uh, the European Medicines Agency agreed that the documents should be released. And at the same time, that was in 2010, so three years after the request for access was made and after the Ombudsman had, had made a recommendation to release the documents, the European Medicines Agency announced a general policy change as regards the, um, the release of such clinical study reports. So we reached a reasonably uh, a good position in 2010. Uh, at the same time, maybe I'll give you one other case which doesn't con uh, concern clinical study reports, but which, also, which I think may also be of interest to you. We had a complaint in 2008 from um, a gentleman. He wasn't a clinician. He was a father of, uh, of um, uh, a teenager who had uh, committed suicide uh, after taking an anti-acne treatment, uh, Rocutane, or otherwise known as Accutane produced by Roche. And he sought access to um, the suspected, unexpected, uh, uh, um, serious adverse drug reaction reports, uh, SUSARS, uh, which are held by the European Medicines Agency. And uh, he, he didn't want them for research purposes. What he wanted, what he wanted them for was uh, he was taking a case against Roche in the Irish courts um, on the basis of his belief that that particular product had, um, had, uh, uh, had an impact on um, his son's condition, and which, uh, uh, which led to suicide, uh, 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 depression and uh, uh, suicidal ideation. Uh, again, uh, happily, um, uh, 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 those documents were released after redacting um, all, any information from the documents which would have uh, um, revealed the identity of any of the, of the persons concerned by the uh, uh, adverse reaction reports. So at that stage, we can say that we were at a reasonably good position with the European Medicines Agency concerning the release of um, clinical study reports, adverse uh, um, uh, um, reaction reports. Uh, then we came to the case of Umira. Uh, you probably, Umira is uh, an anti-inflammatory drug primarily used for the treatment of Crohn's disease, uh, but also is, uh, has um, obtained authorization for a whole series of inflammatory uh, um, diseases. In 2012, um, a researcher sought access to these clinical study reports, and um, uh, Abvi, uh, which is the company which produces uh, Umira, um, brought EMAT to court uh, seeking to block it from releasing these adverse reaction reports. And um, uh, we, the European Ombudsman, intervened in that court case in support of EMAT's efforts to force the release of those documents. Eventually, uh, in March of last year, uh, there was an agreement uh, between the, uh, well, Abvi agreed to drop the court case, and Emma, subsequent to the dropping of the court case, instead of releasing the entire uh, set of three CSRs, uh, it only released redacted versions. And we opened an own initiative inquiry seeking to ascertain why exactly uh, those CSRs um, uh, uh, were redacted. Maybe I'll just give you a few examples because you know, I'm, I'm a lawyer, uh, 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 you're mainly a scientist, medical practitioners, this information is maybe more um, illustrative to you uh, um, uh, as regards the importance of this information. So what did they take out? They took out information as regards the determination of sample size and dosage. They took out of the CSRs a description of the protocol changes and the statistical changes. Um, they took out information relating to the testing methods, testing design. They took out the results uh, 
um, of the histology tests and the histochemistry, histochemistry tests. Uh, now, I'm not a doctor, but having spoken to experts on this issue, uh, histology results in relation to uh, uh, an illness such as Crohn's disease are absolutely uh, vital to the understanding of the effectiveness of, uh, of the particular product. And remember, these CSRs are being submitted to EMMA specifically for the purpose of allowing EMMA to determine whether the product is safe and effective for the purposes of authorizing the product, uh, the product's placement on the market. So this is absolutely vital information. It's not only vital in terms of your ability to obtain information to reevaluate uh, uh, this particular data or to carry out a meta-analysis um, uh, across all of the data that's available. It's also important from the, from, for the purposes of evaluating whether EMA has carried out its work as a regulator correctly uh, when it authorizes the placement of this product on the market. It took out information on secondary endpoints, arguing, well, this is not what the, 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 the person who re requested access wanted. They only wanted information on the primary endpoints. Um, the Ombudsman, uh, when it posed questions to Emma on this issue, asked um, if access to these secondary endpoints would assist in the broad understanding of the risk benefits of Umira. And the, and the Ombudsman also asked if these secondary endpoints were being used off-label by Umira. Um, because all of that information, even if it's not maybe directly used in that particular uh, application for marketing authorization for that specific indication, where the primary endpoint is the most important information, even if it's not relevant for that particular purpose, it's extremely important for clinicians and researchers in order to understand the overall risk benefit of uh, that particular product. Um, we posed about over 50 questions to Emma relating to all of that specific information, asking them, why is all of this information uh, commercially confidential? What legitimate commercial interest is there in uh, withholding any of that information? Uh, happily, uh, that was last October, October 2014. In February, we received the response of Emma uh, uh, which uh, happily has uh, released all of those, uh, all of the points that I've just mentioned to you, all of that information has now been released. There are a few residual issues, uh, 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 um, uh, redactions which, um, uh, which we're, we're still looking at. But in the main, uh, I will say that um, Emma has reacted properly to the Ombudsman's questions. So you might think the, the story ends happily, but maybe I'll just make a sound bite. You know, people say uh, justice delayed is justice denied, but well, access delayed is access denied. Those requests were made in 2012. We're only getting the full, almost full version in February 2015. Uh, likewise with the, uh, um, the request for access the original request by accident by Peter Gotcha, I see him over there, uh, 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 was, that was met in 2007. He got access in 2010. We need to, okay, we have, there have been significant achievements, but we need to move on to that, from that to a situation, I believe, where these documents are put up online as they are being produced. Now, that, that is, the European Medicines Agency has adopted a new policy, which we will look at in detail, uh, uh, relating to new requests for marketing authorizations. As you may know, uh, in May of next year, uh, the Clinical Trials Regulation, Regulation 536-2014, will um, come, into, come into effect. That will lead to, happily, a situation where the European Medicines Agency will have a database of all clinical trials carried out uh, in the EU, um, uh, it's uh, not the case at the moment, and something that maybe needs to be looked at, whether we can move to a, a situation where that information is made proactively available 
without having to make requests, uh, um, requests for it. And I'll end on this point. I'll go back to the issue of transparency in general and, and, and accountability. I say that the public service, if it's transparent, it can be held accountable. Uh, you can say the same thing about the, the pharmaceutical companies and the medicine itself. And if you don't achieve that, well then you don't have legitimacy. You don't have legitimacy for the public service, but you don't have legitimacy, legitimacy for the pharmaceuticals companies, for the medicines, or for medicine in general in the eyes of the public. You don't have legitimacy and you don't have trust. And if you don't have that, the system won't work. So that's where we are, that's what we're doing. We're, I think we're in the middle of a road, uh, 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 and uh, 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 we hope uh, that over the next few years we'll be able to progress further along that road. If there are any questions, uh, I'd be delighted to, to take them. Thank you. Thank you. I like that quote, access delayed is access denied. That's really stuck in my mind. We will be using that one, I, I perceive. Now, there must be people around this room who are interested in this issue. I can see a chap at the back there who's got a request in probably right now, Tom Jefferson. <laughs> would like to. We're going to get you a microphone, Tom. One second. Have we got a microphone at the back there? One second, we've got one here. Good now? That's it? Good. Fergal, thank you very much for that. Um, I just wanted to thank you, Emily O'Reilly, and your office for all you have done and all you continue to do for open science. Thank you. Um, thank you. Very good thank, point. Thank you. Can I, can, I make, can I make one point? The European Ombudsman's decisions are not legally binding. The only way we can convince the likes of the European Medicines Agency to uh, move forward is with the support of the public, of, uh, of, of professionals. So the fact that you are aware of our work and that you make complaints and uh, 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 the BMJ writes articles which, uh, which refers to our work makes us effective. Without that support, we're we're completely ineffective. So we need your support. We, we need your support. We, we have no other way of putting pressure on, on the relevant agencies. Peter. Yeah, uh, Peter Gertrude, the Nordic Conference. And Hello, Peter. Peter. Um, I just wanted to say that um, I, I have come in the European Parliament for quite some years now to try to influence the new law about clinical trials transparency. And we started in a situation where there was massive opposition towards transparency. And it was turned around so that uh, there was massive support for transparency, which is a fantastic victory I just want to tell you about. Uh, so I'm very positive to European Parliament. And uh, when the European Ombudsman accused the EMA of maladministration by not releasing these data to us, then if the EMA had disregarded that, they would have had the whole European Parliament on their back immediately. So your uh, organization, your institution is very well respected and backed up by members of Parliament. So we do have some power. It strikes me there's a tension here between intellectual property uh, on the one hand and uh, the good of the community on the other. Um, are there, has anyone anywhere set up a, a list of definitions of what are valid reasons for commercial sensitivity uh, so there's an objective measure by which any company can be measured in the open, as it were? Well, first of all, I mean, the issue of intellectual property, I would say as a lawyer, I haven't seen in any of the documents I've looked at something which would be, which would constitute intellectual property. I mean, uh, patents, obviously, all of that information is public. The fact that you publish information about it is irrelevant. Uh, yeah, the argument has been made that it's copyright. I think that's a very weak, I won't go into the details of it, I think it's a very weak argument in law, obviously. So uh, 
the issues that might be brought forward, I mean, in the court case, the issues that were discussed would be, let's say if you come up with a, a novel testing design, new way of testing a particular uh, um, uh, uh, um, issue, a particular uh, 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 part of a, a clinical study. Uh, clearly, there might be a commercial interest in protecting that novel design method. But science generally works on standardized benchmarks. Yes, you might come up with novel methods, but it's rather rare. Generally speaking, CSRs don't contain novel testing methods. If they did, we asked Emma, please explain to us, because one of the uh, part of the redactions related to the testing methods. And we asked, the specific question we asked, well, are these novel? Are these not standard? Because we looked at them, we, we, we were able to look at them across the available scientific data, and we see, well, look, these are being referred to in published data. These are not novel. If they had been, yes. But, uh, but the, 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 the issue of law is this. You can only refuse public access to information if you put forward um, uh, arguments which justify the commercial interest. And it has to be a legitimate commercial interest. And uh, let's say information which would allow a competitor to develop a competing product. Um, now, most of the information in the clinical study reports is reported in any case in, in a different, more uh, summarized form in the authorization decision. So it's very unlikely, yes, it's, it's theoretically possible that, the, that there might be information, some information in the CSRs of that nature, but you'd have to describe it specifically and justify why it, uh, it constitutes commercial. So is there a list anywhere of what have we, we accepted we, as commercial sensitive No, because this, as there, was, there has only ever been one court case, and AbbVie withdrew the court case. My view is they withdrew the court case because they knew they'd lose. Well, we were looking forward to our day in court uh, uh, so as to allow the court to set forward those particular uh, criteria. In the, we will have a decision on the uh, UMIRA documents. Emma has given us its opinion on the 2nd of February. We're now uh, uh, going through all of that data for the purpose of writing our decision and we will try and set out some guidelines there. But there is no... I, I don't think it's possible to have a, a, um, an exhaustive list in any case. It should, it should be up to the pharmaceutical company concerned and Emma to put forward specific reasons based on the specific documents. Okay? Okay. There's one last one there, just at about the time. Thank you. Thanks, Carl. Thanks, Virgil. That was a really, really interesting talk. Um, I'm Sheila Lane, and I work at Sense About Science and the All Trials campaign. Yes. You mentioned pharma companies there towards the end of your talk, and yeah, clearly, some pharma companies are actively trying to prevent more transparency. <laughs> and lobbying against it. We saw that in the court cases and we've seen it ourselves in more yes. backstage areas. But a small number, and a small number, are forging ahead yes. and have thought really long and hard about just what they can do to make more information available yes. and what's feasible and what's practical and what's reasonable. It's a small number, but they're doing it and a chasm actually is opening up between yes. what they're making available, what the EMA is making available and what the stragglers are making available. Yes. Is that something that you guys look at when you write your opinions, just what concepts have been proved and what's been proven to be possible in other areas? Well, we're certainly aware of it. We're certainly aware of it. We, sir, obviously, we, 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 deal with ish, we, dish, we deal with problems. We deal with when there, when there are complaints, we will open inquiries. We don't open inquiries when there's no problem, but we're certainly aware of that because it's part of the argument as regards why the others should release their CSRs. Now, each set of CSRs may be, may be specific, but if, uh, if a group of pharmaceutical companies argue, well, look, this information uh, is not commercially confidential, well, that's, that's a, a contextual argument which makes it more difficult for others to argue, I mean, others argue that the entire CSRs, AbbVie's position in the court case was that the entire CSR, there are three sets of CSRs, but the, 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 the entire uh, uh, the set of documentation requested should not be released. Uh, and uh, clearly that position is made more difficult to sustain when uh, there are others in the pharmaceutical industry 
uh, who, who, who think otherwise. And let me just finish on this particular point. It's important for the pharmaceutical industry to understand that they lose out if the legitimacy of the system and trust in the system on the part of researchers, on the part of medical practitioners, and on the part of the public is diminished. So it's in their interest that this system works properly. Thank you. Thank you very much.